So thank you everyone for joining. Um, we have three awesome voice actors here with us today. We have Garrett Kiesel, Heather Gonzalez, and Kimberly Woods. Um, so first of all, thank you for joining and being a part of CasaCon. And Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So let's get right into it. So um, how did you get interested in voice acting? Um, let's start with Kimberly. Oh man, I have always loved cartoons and loved playing video games for the longest time. So uh, it's just something that I always wanted to do. Um, and then I got hired to do a voiceover in college um, for a dance piece. I was a voice that was against war um, and it was this uh, peaceful dance number. And so I think that opportunity, I was like, oh, this is cool. You know, like this is something maybe I can actually do. Um, so when I moved out to LA and after I pursued on camera for a while, um, I jumped into a voiceover class and fell in love. Awesome. That's, uh, what about you, Heather? Uh, Honestly, voiceover was never the place I thought I was going to go. Um, I started performing on stage when I was four in musicals in New York, and theater was like my way, it was my thing. And eventually all of my theater friends moved over to voiceover, and they're like, you should do this thing. And I'm like, no, I need instant gratification. I need applause. I don't want to talk to myself in a booth. Like, that's weird. I'm going to make fun of myself. No, thank you. Um, and then... A friend of mine from tour was like, hey, I teach a class. Just come and take the class. See what you think. You might like it. Uh, so I took the class and I was like, oh, oh, this is what everyone's talking about. This is fantastic. Uh, and that was about three years ago. And I just went head first into it and fell in love with acting all over again because of voiceover. Awesome. And what about you, Garrett? Uh, kind of a mix between the two of Heather and Kimberly. Um, Obviously, animation video games, like growing up, they left a huge impact on my life, and that was fantastic. Um, I did theater uh, in school for a little while, and I absolutely adored it. Loved being on stage, loved, you know, getting to act, all that. Um, but I was really more involved in, like, the musical side of things. Like, I played percussion and drums and, and did all that, and I was really focused on that inherently. Because um, my mom was a musician, so I kind of wanted to... And I have a great relationship with my mom, so I really wanted to, um, you know, uh, kind of go along with what she had planned for me. I, I was completely fine with doing that. Um, but I really did love theater. Like, you know, when I did theater in, in, in school, like, that was the light bulb moment where I was like, oh, but this is what, what I really want to do. This is what I really love to do. Um, and it really wasn't until, like, four, five-ish years ago, I was uh, confronted by a friend uh, from high school, and he's like, hey, I'm moving out to Atlanta, of all places, and I know you've wanted to do acting voiceover for the longest time, and I need somebody to move in with me, mm -hmm. and this is like, I was like, this is the moment, this is the opportunity for me to switch everything over, and I did it, and I haven't looked back, so. Awesome. So it seems like, uh, you know, you all kind of had a background, at least in, ac in regular acting. Um, so when you got into voice acting, did you do anything? Did you have to take any classes or what, what did you do to actually like kind of prepare to become a voice actor? And how is it different, would you say, besides, you know, as Heather said, uh, being in a booth talking to yourself, <laughs> different from regular voice acting? <laughs> um, why don't we start with you, Heather? Um, I went like full hog into classes. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is something so completely different than being on stage because it's being on stage or on camera, you have everything behind you. You have sets, you have costumes, you have all these other people. I can make you believe anything I want just by showing you this other thing. And then you're like, oh yeah, I'm with you. I'm totally there, suspension of disbelief. Whereas in the booth, it's just you and you're so vulnerable and mm -hmm. you're so alone <laughs> as it were. Um, then I was like, this is, all of my tricks don't work here. I, I can't use any of my <laughs> tricks here. So I went full into acting. Um, I used the pandemic and the fact that everything went online mm. to take classes all across the country with all sorts of different people um, in commercial and video game and in dubbing and animation, just anything I could get into. 
um, anyone I could meet to be like, tell me about your thing. How do you do this? How did you do that? And just take the nuggets as you can and, and apply them every day behind the mic. And it's just been incredible. Awesome. What about you, uh, Laura? You said that you did like some on-screen acting as well. So what has been your experience? Or oh, sorry, Kimberly. I don't know why I said Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, so I started out, I did some theater in college, and then when I came to L.A., I did a lot of uh, scene study classes and audition for on-camera stuff. So that was my um, foundation, was uh, those core acting classes at first. Um, and then I took an acting class with Dave Finoy. Um, the voiceover industry is so nice. Um, <laughs> like Heather's saying, like, you can people offer advice, and they're just wonderful. So Dave offered advice on, like, which classes I should take. Um, so I followed his recommendations and hopped into all of those classes, um, and yeah, just hit the ground running with the classes. I think in particular, like, as far as the differences between film and theater and, and being in a booth talking by yourself, like, you have to create the whole world, mm -hmm. um, and the environment and imagine who you're talking to and what they look like in your relationship with that person. You don't have that person to play off of. Uh, most of the time so you're making it up yourself and it doesn't matter too like you can be crying in the booth but if it's not reading in your voice mm -hmm. um you know audience isn't seeing you so you have to really just make sure you're like carrying that or pushing it more so that it reads interesting and you mentioned you know you, you both mentioned kind of classes and stuff so what ki what kinds of classes um helped you the most um, either one, Heather uh, or Kim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I first started with animation classes um, and commercial classes just to get a feel. It's good to get a feel for what you like, what mm -hmm. genre you like, and, and for that particular area that you're interested in. For me in particular, I think improv classes also wildly helped with voiceover because I didn't do much improv before doing voiceover, but a lot of the times for voiceover, you know, sometimes you don't know what you'll be reading. Sometimes you don't know what character you'll be playing until you're in the booth. So having that improv experience and being able to kind of just come up with a character on the fly and have fun and get out of your head is super important in voiceover. That's awesome. What about you, Heather? Uh, I think for me it wasn't the type of class that really like started to spark different things but it was the teacher themselves mm -hmm. um there were a few teachers who they the way that they taught or they um there's one in particular kal who's amazing um and he teaches you more of the theater of the mind and really like being able to put yourself in that surrounding and how far away is it and how close are you to this and how are they looking at you and how are you like just being able to put yourself into that moment and it was those sort of classes that really sparked with me and I was like oh this is still theater it's just in here now mm -hmm. let's do this it's a, it's a great point that you mentioned because yeah like you said again you don't have like the backgrounds or anything to help people so or yourself really to really get you in the mood so it's you have to be a lot more I guess use your imagination a lot more for voice acting um, what about you, Garrett? What has been some classes or teachers or even tips uh, that you got in the beginning that really helped you? Ooh, let's see. Uh, well, when I moved, I, I'd kind of been out of the acting scene for a little bit, so I wanted to do anything I could to, you know, uh, really strengthen my abilities, strengthen my acting abilities and, and all that. So when I moved, I really, like, hit the ground running and, and did anything I could to enroll in whatever I thought I needed to that would, you know, help. Um, so I, I definitely did a lot of research, uh, made sure I studied with, you know, uh, good teachers, uh, ones who had a lot of great reviews, all that stuff. Um, some stuff that really helped me, I think, mostly is definitely improv, like Kimberly said. Um, that, that changed a lot of stuff for me, especially when, like what Kimberly said, like you don't know what, what, what character you're going to be playing. Um, it really helps you, like, be prepared. And uh, physical, physical movement classes really have been uh, huge for me as well because physicality is everything in the booth mm -hmm. absolutely everything um so yeah um a anything that you think would apply to voice acting like improv physical movement um 
screen, uh, script study, all of that, I think it all, it all really helps. It's interesting that you mentioned physicality because again, you're, you know, no one's really seeing you in the booth. So what exactly, right. how, how does that help with your voice acting? What does that, what does that do for you? <laughs> well, I would say, especially when you're doing like uh, video game recordings or animation mm. recordings, fight scenes, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta be prepared. You gotta be ready. You gotta you, you gotta make it believable. Mm. You gotta make it uh, make the audience believe that you're actually launching an attack in the booth or, or getting hit or whatever it may be. So you gotta make sure that that comes through to the audience. Interesting. Um, cool. So you know, I, and I'm sure the answers will vary. But for people who are interested in getting started with voice acting. Um, what kind of like affordable gear <laughs> do you suggest um, for people who you know they don't want to break the bank but they kind of want you know obviously voiceovers you want to have good audio quality so what what are some suggestions that maybe you had when you started off or that you would suggest now that you've been doing voice acting for a little bit um, let's start with you Garrett sure um... I would say if you're just starting out um, and you're not sure if you want to take the full dive yet, if you're maybe like interested or whatever it may be, um, I would say looking at investing in a USB microphone, a really good USB microphone uh, might be good to start. Like, I feel like everyone's heard of the Blue Yeti, right. but that's like <laughs> universally like the really, really good one. Um, I, I had a friend actually approach me the other day about like inexpensive um, XLR cable microphones. And I suggested, I believe, the Audio Technica, I think it was the AT2020, I believe, that ran about like a uh, hundred bucks, I'm pretty sure. And when I got started, and I started, um, well, more so when I started like uh, building my own uh, home studio setup and all that, my first, my very first mic was the Blue Bluebird. And it's on the relatively inexpensive side, I think that ran me like 200, 250. But that was a, a good microphone for me for, for a while. Mm -hmm. So I would say those mics for sure if you're looking to get started. What about you, Heather and Kimberly? Um, I would say, I mean, always do your research and, and know that the mics are always going to vary for everybody. The, the type of voice you have, the timbre of your voice, where it sits, it's going to change on every microphone. So not everyone can be like, this is the mic, because... <laughs> it might sound different for you. Mm -hmm. um, I was very lucky, my husband is in audio, so he had all this gear already, and I was like, cool, I'm just gonna set this up. <laughs> um, but I um, have heard in other classes and have looked up uh, on Amazon also, there are packages for like the Rode NT1, mm -hmm. um, which is also a pretty decent mic, and they'll do packages with the mic and a pop filter and a Scarlett. Um, and I think that runs somewhere between 250 and 300. Uh, but for all those pieces, that's that's a pretty decent price, I would think. What about you, Kimberly? Uh, my my starter mic was the AET twenty twenty USB, um, and I started out in my coat closet. <laughs> so I would also just say um, find a, a quiet space because your space is actually more important than any fancy microphone. Um, so I had my little it was like two and a half by three and a half coat closet. And I put some acoustic foam on the walls, um, had my little microphone in there, had uh, my laptop just outside of it, um, because the laptop sometimes makes noise, and had an iPad in there to read mm. and copy from. And so that's how I started. Right. And then, Heather, you mentioned um, an interesting point that I think a lot of people might not think about, um, at least people who maybe haven't done voice acting or streaming or things like that, but you know, you're talking about like the direction of your mic, the placement and all of that stuff. So how exactly, you know, what are some tips on actually like setting up your mic properly so that you're not getting extraneous sounds or you're not getting like, you know, when you're speaking into it, you're not hearing like the, the spit in your mouth and all of that stuff, you know, you're not getting all of those sounds. <laughs> I feel like you always get the spit in your mouth no matter where your <laughs> microphone is. Just that day where like, I need more water today. Um, I would say what Kimberly said is super important. Your space, where you're set up, a closet is fantastic because clothes are natural noise dampeners. Um, I've recorded from the back of a car before. 
never, if you're going to do that, face the windows. You're just going to get sound bouncing back at you. But if you set it up facing, like, the back seat, we were in the, I was in the back of, a, like, a minivan. So I had the whole thing on the back seat of a minivan at one point. Um, not something I suggest, but if you're on the road and yeah. you have to do it, <laughs> it works. Um, and then a lot of it is trial and error. Once you have the space that you want to use, where your microphone sits in that space changes. Like if your if your mic is set up in a corner, it's going to change the sound versus a flat wall mm -hmm. versus a rounded space. Um, and it's a lot of trial and error. Move your mic, do some recording, see how it sounds. Move your mic again, do some recording, see how it sounds. Um, until you find the the sweet spot for you and your voice. Yeah, that's a, that's interesting to know because again, like. You know, we don't really think about the acoustics of things too much unless you're a voice actor or like a musician, um, when you have to think about those things. Um, and you, you know, you also, speaking of like recording, what exactly, um, and anybody can answer this if you um, have, a, have an answer, but what are, what are studios or auditions or whatever, what are they looking for in terms of audio quality like when will things get rejected or be like you know this sucks or oh too much whatever like what what are some um suggestions that you would make for people who are recording and how to get the best audio quality and whoever wants to chime in <laughs> garrett <laughs> kimberly <laughs> I would just emphasize again a quiet space mm -hmm. you don't want too much extraneous noise you know neighbors walking by so do whatever you can to mitigate the outside noises so find that quiet space um, and then like Heather said it's just going to be trial and error as far as like recording and listening to yourself and how does it sound and make sure you're listening with good like headphones too don't just listen through your laptop speakers because mm -hmm. you're not going to hear exactly how it's sounding you're going to get a better idea with your your headphones on and hear those little like, mic bumps or plosives and stuff like that um I, I also wanted to say a couple recording software to start out with mm -hmm. um audacity is the free one uh, twisted wave is one i started out with early that i love that's pretty inexpensive it's like 75 80 bucks and it's very clean and easy to use and get started with um, so that's what i would recommend but yeah get used to listening back to your own voice yeah I feel <laughs> like that, that takes a while in the beginning yeah I feel like that's the hardest because everybody I mean at least I do like oh I hate hearing myself talk <laughs> so getting used to that I just wanted to jump in really quick on what Kimberly said about the the recording stuff yeah um don't try it like even after you're like oh i'm not a beginner anymore i'm like doing things audacity is still great i still use audacity my husband literally tried to show me reaper yesterday and i was like i don't i can't please give me back on it's so much easier just the bit please uh so don't be like oh it's free it's not good it still does the job it still works for home recording i've recorded multiple projects on it good job <laughs> Awesome. Um, so going kind of into more of like um, the actual work side, um, how long did it take you to land your first role? Whoever wants to start, Garrett, maybe? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, when, I, when I first moved and decided to go like head first into the whole voice acting thing, um, I, I really spent a lot of my time just trying to stay focused and get training because I really wanted to be prepared when that moment came, at least for me. Um, I would say maybe, because the first big thing I booked was uh, Dawn Defender 4 and Smite, mm. and that was maybe two years after I started. So, but again, like I, I was really focused on like just sticking to training for the time being, making sure I had good demos and, and all of that fun stuff, so. What about you, Kimberly? Same, like, I I made sure to do a lot of training before I was really auditioning. I wanted to feel confident and feel like I knew what I was doing before I submitted anything that people could hear. Um, I wanted to make a good first impression. Uh, so... I'm, one of the things I booked was a commercial while, while I was studying with 
Nancy Wilson that came through her. Um, so that happened kind of early on, but I feel like after that it was violence for a while. <laughs> and so that's just, I think it's part of the things you have to learn to navigate though, is it's just like this industry is a lot of up and down. You mm -hmm. might get something right away and then you might have to wait for a while and you just keep training. And I think that's why it's so important to surround yourself with people and workshops and stuff like that so that they can give you the feedback that you're still on the right track. You know, even if you're not booking yet, you're still, you know, batting and hitting that ball, right. and, you know, over the fence or I guess not over the fence. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know my baseball analogies. <laughs> Hold on. Um, but yeah. <laughs> what about you, Heather? Um, the first commercial I booked was about three months into switching over to voiceover um, and commercial was was the place that I felt the most confident at the time I felt very like I understand how commercial sound I understand how advertising works and so that was like I, I felt comfortable going out and auditioning for that already um, my first video game which uh, was voice matching for Trails of Cold Steel 4 um, which for a first video game voice matching someone who has a fan base is terrifying <laughs> Um, that came about a year into, into my voiceover career. Okay. Um, cool. So, you know, Kimberly, you mentioned that one of, like, the first role you got was kind of a recommendation from a teacher. Do you think, have you found that a lot of these, um, you do get a lot of recommendations for jobs from other voice actors or teachers or whatever? Like, what's the... And any, you know, Heather, or, uh, Garrett, you can also chime in too. Um, but, you know, what's the ratio of how many recommendations you get versus how many, like, actual cold auditions that you um, do? When I was first starting, that was where I got most of my auditions from was coaches or other voice actors who would recommend me for a job and then I would get the audition um, and be able to audition. Uh, for that job. So I definitely th think that's a great way to to go about getting auditions when you're first starting. Um, and also, you know, you know at that point that maybe you're ready because the coach is recommending right. you or that person is, you know. So you also have that kind of stamp of, okay, I'm ready to do this. Um, so yeah, that was, for me starting out, I think that was that was definitely a good way to get some of those auditions early on. What about you, Garrett or Heather? Uh, yeah, I would say it's, it's, it was the same for me, pretty much, at least with uh, going to different studios and teachers. Um, they recommended me to different uh, production studios just around the Atlanta area at the beginning, and that's kind of how I started getting auditions. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty similar to Kimberly, honestly. Nothing much more to say, but it was, it was the same experience for me, I would say, in the beginning. I think mine was a little different. Um, once I was comfortable with my demos, I actually started cold marketing um, and sending out for myself. Um, and it wasn't until I had already started booking myself on things that I think I was showing the confidence enough for other actors to be like, oh, oh, hang on, you, you know what you're doing, cool, I have a recommendation. Mm -hmm. And then um, slowly people started uh, recommending me for stuff and things like that. But I do a lot of my own self-marketing. Awesome. And that kind of leads it into a, my next question. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I know some voice actors too in New York City and they have agents. Um, and is that something that you use? Are you more of a, you know, Heather, it seems like you kind of do it yourself kind of thing, your own marketing. <laughs> um, but what would you say if you have used an agent or if you haven't, you know, what are the pros of having one? If you haven't had one, what do you think are the pros and cons of not having one. Um, why don't we start with you, Heather? Um, I actually do. I have two do, agents. Okay. I have an agent in LA and one in New York. Um, the nice thing about having an agent is you get a lot of auditions that you cannot cold market yourself. You get the Disney's, you get the AAA games, you get the national commercial brands, uh, things that, that they only go to agents for auditions. They don't just pick anyone who sends them an email. Um, but I will say that it is not a necessity when you're starting, mm -hmm. and that to this day, 90%, 95% of 
of the work that I do, I've gotten myself, um, either through cold marketing or networking or recommendations, and about 5% of the work that I do comes through either of my agents. Okay. Kimberly or Garrett, what, what has your, been your experience? I agree. Like having, I'm with an LA agent right now, and having that agent opens the door to more of the bigger opportunities. Um, like Heather said, more of the Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon stuff, and more of the AAA games. Um, but it's important to note that you can, like we said earlier, you can get those auditions initially without an agent. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> you kind of need to be doing that before you approach an agent, because an agent is going to be wanting somebody who's already booked stuff and that you know they know is working. So yeah, you can definitely get auditions without an agent um, through recommendations, through workshops, through networking and following up. And um, there's online stuff too, but you just have to be careful and know your worth and make sure you're not undercutting rates when you're submitting for that sort of stuff. Absolutely. So it's interesting. Um, we actually had a panel at our last con about knowing your worth uh, personally and professionally. We had a voice actor on there. And, you know, I think it is, especially when you're getting started, it's easy to be like, oh, and, and you know, I think everybody does this as whatever artist, writer, photographer, whatever, voice actor too, you know, you start off like, I'll do a couple for free just to like build up my portfolio, but then it gets hard, you know, other people hear that you're doing stuff for free, so it gets harder and harder to be like, no, I gotta, I gotta start charging. <laughs> um, awesome. Um, so, you know, you also mentioned, and I feel like I'm probably overlapping with another panel here, but you know, you, you all kind of mentioned networking. Um, so what exact, like how exactly, especially when you're just getting started, um, how exactly do you network with other people? Um, and then what have you found to be kind of the best ways to do so and kind of build your network and build those connections? Um, Garrett or Heather or Kim, whoever. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I definitely want to say, I want to reiterate that again, like, before you network and try to make those connections, um, your demos should probably be up to snuff, um, be really good quality. Um, let's see. Um, I mean, really just like going to classes, meeting other actors, um, go, goes back to what I said about, you know, having your demos ready. Like if you're doing like, uh, what Heather said, like cold marketing or anything like that, like if you're sending out emails, uh, you can email, uh, different production studios, uh, production directors, uh, audio engineers, uh, that sort of thing. And, and they could definitely be connections that can be used later on in the future to help you get more work. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I would say uh, cold marketing has helped uh, for me some. They've gotten me uh, a good number of jobs in the past. I think that's very effective. And um, I, I've, like we've stated, I I've also had uh, friends who have, who have recommended me who are actors to other jobs. So. Yeah. What about you, Heather? Um, I think classes is definitely mm -hmm. the way to start with that. And remembering that, like, so I'm very methodical about how I take classes. There are certain classes that I'm going to take just because I want to learn. I am there to screw up and screw up big and learn everything I can. And there are some classes that I'm going to take specifically because I know this person teaching mm -hmm. also casts. I want to get in front of them, I want to put my best foot forward, I'm not trying to uh, learn something new here, I'm just trying to reiterate what I'm good at and get feedback on that. Um, so being aware of that when you're going into classes, really researching who the person is and what type of class this is for you, um, and going to them when you're at that level. So when you're at the level where you're just learning flat out, that's what you want to do, great. When you're at the level where you have the demos and you're ready to start the networking, that's when you start really researching and going, okay, what can I do for this person? What can this person give back to me? Kind of a thing. And then also remembering when you're in those classes that, especially when you're at the level where you're putting your best foot forward and you want to be seen by someone, 90% of the other people in that class are either in the same spot or already past you. They are great networks as well. So like when we were in-person classes getting to actually like talk and, and communicate and, and 
be a part of that community with those people. It's fantastic. It's a little harder when you're on the Zoom classes, but you know, putting in the chat, hey, that was great, whatever. Give your, you know, your your applause little icon on the top <laughs> so they know that you're paying attention to them too. Um, I've met so many great people and gotten connections with people that I had no idea. The girl who went before me also does casting. Mm -hmm. No idea. But after I went, she sent me a thing going, hey, you're really good. Kid, um, send me your email, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's not just the teacher that you're looking to impress or, or network with. It's the people around you. Um, and not just the ones who have something to offer you. Um, there are going to be people, if you take enough classes, and I take a lot of classes, <laughs> there are going to be people that you see all the time and these are the people that you come up with and as you start seeing like the Twitter announcements and stuff go out about people's casting you like you'll recognize your group mm -hmm. that are coming up together and starting to like become that little bubble in the industry um, and it's a really nice thing to have a group of people that you've come up with that you're all taking the same classes and and you have those people that you can have that conversation of hey how's this going with you oh this isn't so great for me or you can even do a um i can't imagine, tell you the number of times someone has texted me and been like hey can you do a really quick peer coaching audition like i have an audition and i, I just want to get some, someone else's ear on it and you know you jump in with those people and and you do peer coaching with each other and it's it's fantastic and it's all from just being open to meeting the people around you and not being so focus on your own thing that you forget that everyone else is there in that same tunnel with you and you guys can all do it together which is fantastic about the voiceover community that there's such a community it was such a weird mix coming from theater and film being like wait you want to tell someone about me and then you're not going to get this job that's weird <laughs> Yeah, I, and I think that's super important. What you were saying is, um, and I think it's one of the reasons, something that I think a lot of people struggle with in terms of when they hear networking, they're like, oh, it's like this icky word. <laughs> um, because it's like, oh, I have to like sell myself. I have to, you know, try to get something from someone. But I, I think kind of approaching it in that manner where it's like, no, you're just kind of trying to uh, make friends, really. Um, and be in this boat together of up-and-coming voice actors who share their struggles <laughs> and their wins and victories. Um, I think it's a it's it's kind of the a different way to approach it, and I think should hopefully make people more comfortable um, when they go into these situations by viewing it that way. Um, awesome. So, kind of jumping to a different. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I just wanted to emphasize what Heather was saying too. Um, 100 percent uh, I think that it's, it's more about making those genuine connections and it's so easy in the voiceover industry because there's so many nice people so it's not about like networking how do I get what I want mm -hmm. it's like what can I what advice can I offer this person and what can I learn from this person and how can we encourage each other as far as like fellow voice actors and then if you are submitting a demo or something to the casting person after the workshop and they don't respond, it's important to follow up. I mean, don't be annoying, like, you know, but don't just take it as, oh my gosh, they're not interested, because sometimes, you know, I've had opportunities to come about when I followed up, like, in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. And follow up maybe with something, like, if you book something or have something else to announce or just a friendly, like, you know, it's a holiday and you want to wish them a happy holiday, like, something just authentic. <laughs> You know, that feels good for you. That isn't that, like, icky mm -hmm. networking feeling. Yeah. I send out legitimate Christmas cards. <laughs> yeah, no, I like, think... Or I'll send, like, a postcard, something that's paper that they can, like... Mm -hmm. And it's it's just that little bit of human touch where you're like, oh, you're a person, and you thought about me as a person. That's so nice. Yeah. And, I, you know, I... It's, uh... It is interesting because, again, like even just following up, right? Like, whether it's a couple weeks or whatever, or just be like, hey, what's up? Um, you also have to understand that the people who you're, especially casting directors, I'm sure, are like super busy and super swamped. And so they might forget or something might happen. Yeah. Um, so just even being like, hey, what's up? And they might be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like I totally forgot. Um, and it's just like, like a good reminder. But again, like, you know, as with any job interview, you don't want to like email them every 10 minutes. <laughs> um, awesome. So, 
you know, you, you talk about classes and all of this stuff. So um, one of the things that I hear and I also um, hear people say a lot in voice acting is like your range, right? Like what is the range? What is a range? How do you find your range? <laughs> and how do you expand upon your range? Um, why don't we start with Kimberly? Um, well, different ways to look at your range. There's your vocal range, um, which is kind of like, what ages do you play? And again, this is this is experimenting yourself and recording yourself and listening and saying, okay, what do I naturally fit into? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, and then just trying to expand upon that. And I think singing, for me, helps a lot as far as pitch range. But... In addition to just vocal range, there's also the types of characters that you play. Um, and so just experimenting with that too, you know, like maybe naturally you can play the cute bubbly type, but can you also be the villain? You mm -hmm. know, can you also be the kind of like dark person that's like, you know, cackling <laughs> seductively? Um, so just exploring with that. <laughs> so. What about you, Garrett? Uh, yeah, no. Uh, again, I hate to be a broken record, but I agree with what Kimberly said. I mean, <laughs> for me personally, uh, when I first moved, uh, I, I definitely knew that expanding my range was something that I wanted to work on. So it was definitely an experimental process, just getting in the booth, recording, listening to myself back. What can I believably, believably play? But also, how can I how can I push it a bit? Um, so for me, I studied with an uh, opera singer uh, who I'm forgetting where she she taught at a university down in Georgia. I'm, I'm spacing on which one, uh, but she was really like, uh, well, like acclaimed, like she was really good. And I studied with her for maybe a few months and there was a, a drastic change in my vocal range after that amount of time. And it was very, very beneficial. So singing for me definitely mm. helped a lot. Interesting. What if you can't sing? <laughs> well, I can't. I can't sing. <laughs> I can't sing at all. <laughs> so I, I went into that as like, uh, okay, I'm gonna try to learn the basics here, but I'm also gonna expand my range. But yeah. believe me, at the beginning, I was not a good singer. So. <laughs> and what about you, Hebe? Um. Well, first, I just want to say, Kimberly, I'm going to start practicing cackling seductively <laughs> because I want this on my special skills. Um, but I think I, I agree with both of them. It's a lot of practice and a lot of um, just stretching yourself and, and being comfortable having that moment with yourself to be like, oh, what does this sound like? Oh, that's not good. Um, but then not going, oh, that's not good. Never do that again. Going, oh, that's not good. Why is it not good? What don't I like? How can I make it better? Um, but then also knowing, especially when you're first starting, or even when you're not, like there are celebrities who do this and they don't have a big pitch range or like, they sound like them, you know, like Patrick Warburton sounds like Patrick Warburton, no matter what you put him in, right. the range is the acting, you know, and so don't get, don't feel defeated if you can't be, you know, a two year old child and an old crone. Mm -hmm. That's okay. That's not where your voice sits for you. Focus then on your acting range. Where can, what can this sound do in different acting spaces? Yeah, and I think that's a great point because I feel like, you know, a lot of people probably think voice acting, oh, we have to do all of these like different characters and I gotta be, you know, what, you know, Mickey Mouse and then I have to be, you know, whoever, you know, Batman or something, right? <laughs> Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. And I think um, something that another voice actor had said before was basically like, your rate, like make sure, make sure you can do that voice consistently over time. So yeah, maybe you can do this voice, but if you can't do it for like the entire thing or the entire show, you can't like you shouldn't try it. You shouldn't put that in your demo. <laughs> yeah, Nothing if it is hurt you in the audition, yeah, yeah. don't send yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, Awesome. So, and then you, you all kind of me mentioned like singing. Now, what what has that actually done for you? Like, you know, you get to hear like your pitch and stuff. But is there anything else that singing has like brought to your voice acting or helped improve um, your I voice would acting? Definitely say so. Um, I grew up in musical theater, so I grew up singing. Um, but I also grew up 
uh, imitating singers. Mm -hmm. And so it sort of trains your ear on, especially if you're trying to do voice matching or things like that. Um, when I book voice matches, I will literally listen to it and hum the actor's tones so that I can figure out where it is and then start speaking it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other thing that not just singing, but being musical in general has really helped with is anything in terms of dubbing. It's such a rhythm and it's such a, um, just a, a screws with your brain sometimes. <laughs> um, but musicians and singers have an easier time dubbing because they have that musicality, they mm -hmm. have that flow and rhythm um, and it just, it, it connects well, I guess. That's interesting. I wouldn't have thought that, I guess. So you mean dubbing as in, like, other, you're not dubbing English, you're dubbing over other languages, I'm assuming. Because I know they, they do, like, uh, yeah, overdubbing other in dubbing other languages English and stuff. into English, or even um, not just dubbing, but doing any sort of video game where there's any sort of timing involved. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's not... Um, dubbing as much as they'll play you the video and you can see the mouth. Right. Sometimes it's they'll play you the original sound and you need to make it within that two seconds that they made it in. Only, you know, for them it's like three words and in English it's like 15. <laughs> um, so being able to match that flow and that rhythm. Right. Okay. Um, what about you, Kimberly? Um, in addition to what Heather said, I think uh, for me, taking singing classes, it also gave me a way to cool down or, or warm up mm -hmm. for sessions uh, that I didn't have, and that's super important, especially for the like four-hour vocally stressful sessions, uh, to make sure that you're warming up and cooling down because you can <laughs> kind of lose your voice for a little bit, and so knowing how to warm up and cool down the proper way will get you back to that proper speaking voice. Um, more quickly. So I think that, and then also breath control. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very helpful for breath control too. You brought up a good point that's actually um, I wanted to bring up too is how do you, how do you besides the warm-ups, um, how do you take care of your voice? How do you make sure you're not straining it? Like there's gonna be like you're gonna be yell, let something's yelling, screaming, whatever, going on like four or five hours. Let's say you're reading like a you know ebook or whatever. Um, <laughs> so how do you how do you like take care of your voice, um, Garrett? Let's start with you. Oh, well, I drink a, a ton of water, <laughs> ton of water, uh, room temperature water mostly. Um, that's really helpful for me. Uh, if I'm no, if I know I'm going to be doing uh, a really strenuous session the next day, I'm going to make sure I'm getting plenty of rest, uh, like eight to nine hours. <laughs> and I'll usually have like, I'm, even if it's summer, I'm going to have like uh, a mug of hot, uh, non-caffeinated tea with a little bit of honey in there. And that um, definitely soothes the throat for the next morning or afternoon or whenever the session is. Um, you know, lozenges can help, cough drops, with, cough drops, whatever you call them. Um, but those are the things that I would say help me mostly. And just not, you know, if you know you have a session that day, just not, just laying off the voice bit, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> not going out and partying, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> of course. <laughs> what about you, Heather? What are some tips you have to... Um... Pretty much the same, lots of yeah. water, lots of tea, um, Nim Jam is amazing, it tastes awful, but it really, really helps during uh, the, the vocally stressful situations. Um, and, and also, pre-thinking about all this, like we said before, if, if you auditioned for a character and it hurt your voice auditioning for it, maybe don't send it, because that'll be the one you book and that'll be the one you scream in for four hours. Um, and sometimes it's not possible, I did a session where they did not tell me I was going to be playing two characters. Mm -hmm. My first character was in my normal range. The second one, they wanted to be a tougher female in like a military kind of thing. And so I had to go deeper into the register and down into the gravelly pits where it all has that texture, which is fantastic until you're dying for four hours. And then not so much. <laughs> um, so, you know, those moments sometimes will come up and, and surprise you and you're, Usually the people running the sessions, the producers, the directors, um, they are very aware of that and they're very good about breaks and they're very good about, you know, 
making the intense lines either at the end and all in one spot so that you don't, you're not, you know, screaming and then whispering and then being okay and then screaming again, um, which can really throw off your vocal cords. Um, and then just remember, stop talking. If you've had a session like that, I know it's hard and you want to go home and talk to whoever and just be normal, but just don't talk, just stop. <laughs> don't whisper, that's worse. Um, and, and just pay attention to your body. Your body will tell you when there is trouble, you will feel it. Um, don't be like, oh, I can push past this, I can, I can go further. Uh, if your body is telling you don't do it, don't do it. Makes sense. Um, anything to add to that, Kimberly? Uh, for me too, I had to be more aware, because I have a lot of like sinus problems, I get a lot of sinus headaches. And um, regulating that was important for me and my voice as far as, you know, regularly using the Nutty Bottle and rinsing with, like, saline solution to make sure everything's nice and clear. So it's, like, it's important to know about your body and what affects your voice. Also, are there types of food that affect your voice mm. or, like, types of beverages? I've noticed that I can have, like, a cup of coffee. That's fine. But lately, you know, I can't do coffee and then have, like, wine the night before a big session or something. So... Just know what works for your voice and know how it gets affected by things um, and make sure you're doing your best to protect it and keep it healthy. Makes sense. Um, so we kind of touched upon some projects and I feel like most people are familiar with, you know, the, obviously video games, uh, voice acting, um, you know, anime, you have the dubbing community, but what other projects besides those two are available for people that they can, you know, jump into if they're like, you know, I'm not really into video games or anime. <laughs> uh, there are so many genres. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> um, there's a lot. Something that people don't think about is like a telephony, which is basically mm -hmm. the on hold people oh. who tell you, you know, press eight to do this and press pound. That's a whole section of voiceover. <laughs> there are people that just do that. Um, corporate narration. I do a lot of um, corporate narration. I do a lot of um, instructional videos that, you know, they'll only ever get seen by so-and-so training for this company. Um, there's, uh, there's so much. Yeah, there's a lot. Um, yeah, I was going to say audiobooks are huge. Uh, I think now some more than ever. They've been really lucrative for me lately. Um, Corporate narration, honestly, is like where the, as far as, far as like voiceover goes, I, I think corporate narration is where like the real money is. So, uh, I yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Corporate narration, uh, commercials, yeah, e learning, telephony work. Uh, oh gosh. <laughs> like, yeah, there's, there, there's so much. Promos and trailers. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, Podcasts, audio dramas. Audience. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't even think about telephone stuff. Um, so that's it. That's great that you brought it up. It's like, oh yeah, you do have a voice. You do have voices for that. Um, and then I wonder about. I mean, maybe they've already um, found all the voices, but like GPS stuff. Like I know that there's what you know they borrowed voices for those kinds of too. Um, but I'm sure that's more of like a one and done kind of deal. <laughs> but. Awesome. Um, all right. So, what was the single best piece of advice you received from someone in regards to voice acting, or or just in general? <laughs> um, voice acting is acting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, so much. I'm like, oh no. There's there's a lot. Um, for, for me, it's easy for me personally to compare myself to other people, so I, I try to tell myself all the time that I am my own competition. The only person I'm con competing against is myself. Am I better than I was yesterday? That, that's all that's important to me. So that, that's really helped me personally to, to, you know, forget about what everybody else is doing, but just focus on myself and just kind of keep moving forward. Um, not forget about what everybody else is doing per se, but you know what I mean. Um, I think one, and, and it's weird because you don't really think about it as voiceover, but it, it once you're in the community and you kind of see 
the social media aspect side of it is Twitter is not reality. Mm -hmm. um, you'll, you know, and, and Kimberly touched on it earlier, it, we ebb and flow and sometimes we have lots of work and sometimes we have nothing for months and, you know, you'll, you'll be online and you'll see Twitter exploding with all of these people announcing things and you're suddenly like, I am a failure <laughs> and I can't, I'm not real and nothing works and you're like, this is a moment in their time. Twitter is not reality. Don't let it affect your voiceover career. What about you, Kimberly? Uh, yeah. For me, something Dave Finoy said early on was it might take them a while to hear you. And that stuck with me <laughs> during a lot of the downtime because it was it was it's more about what you bring to it mm -hmm. and you can be bringing something special every time but it takes clients and people that haven't heard your voice a while to like really hear you and really like oh she's doing something interesting and then like learn to trust you that you can you know as they hear your auditions and hear you keep bringing that um then they'll start calling you in for more things but it can take a while so just like keep that in your mind that it may take a while for them to hear you, but don't let that stop you from bringing yourself 100% every time in your most authentic self. That's good. That, uh, I think I one mean, other yeah. one, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was gonna say like, like you are unique. Like you, your voice is your voice. So roll with that. Another really good one is uh, the audition is the job. Mm. Your job as a voice mm. over artist yeah. is to audition. Um, when, if you book the job, sweet, icing on the cake. Um, but your cake is that audition. So treat every single one like that is the job and, and then you are a voice actor. You're doing the thing. Awesome. Um, so besides the advice you got, um, and maybe we can think of something different uh, for this one, but what would you tell your younger self about voice acting? Maybe for before you even got into voice acting, what would you tell them? <laughs> just like Not general advice. Thing. General advice or just okay. be like, it's all, you know, wow, it's a lot harder than I thought, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> You're gonna book. A, you're gonna. You're gonna one day be on the com a commercial on national TV. You know. <laughs> My younger self would be flipping out if he knew that I was what I was doing right now. Ah <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. Um, I would say to celebrate, celebrate every little victory. Mm. I would tell my younger self. Because I, sometimes it's easy to like overlook the small things because you have a huge goal in your mind and you're not there yet. And so you're like, well, I haven't gotten there yet. I don't know, should I, you know, it's not that special, but like it is like everything that you book, um, every like little progress you make, celebrate it. That's what I would say. That's good. Um, I would say uh, write down your goals, create a roadmap because I didn't do that early on, and so I felt like for a while I was kind of like aimlessly wandering, mm -hmm. and this just goes for like life in general. But um, once I started to do that, things, uh, things kind of turned around for me. Um, I felt like I, I had a purpose and I was actually working towards something, so. Awesome. What about you, Heather? Um, I would just say try it. It's not as scary as you think. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot, like for me, one of the reasons why I was always like, no, never, I'll make fun of myself is because it terrified me. I was like, I don't want to be alone and vulnerable in a room and, and acting without all the things that make you not actually look at me, but look at what I'm doing. Um, and that was one of the reasons that I felt like I had to do it is because it was so scary to me. Um, so if I could tell my younger self something, it would just be, try it. It's not so scary. Awesome. Um, I have the chat open here. I'm going to see if there were any questions. If you do have any questions, you can type them up in the chat. Question time. Yes, question time. Um, so what, while I'm waiting for people to type. Um, I'm just going to, sorry. Go ahead. 
Oh, I was just gonna jump off what Heather said too about also do what scares you. Mm. So I feel like a lot of the classes that I've grown the most from in this are, is like doing the stuff that scares me, like singing scared me. Oh. <laughs> and I grew so much after taking those singing lessons and even improv scared me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and those I feel I like were the most beneficial for me afterwards. Yeah. Um, okay. I completely agree with that. So one question. What is a good beginning roadmap? I assume this is for Garrett since you mentioned it for voice acting. Like what, what, what did you, you said you didn't have one and then you built one. So what did you, what, were the, what was a roadmap that you set up for yourself? Um, well, what I think I did is, let's see. I definitely researched a ton of classes and thought the, of the ones that'd be most beneficial to me and I had um, little uh, tick marks or check boxes or whatever you, you want to call them. And um, I just kind of went down the list and be like, okay, these are the things I want to tackle. These are the things that I specifically want to get better at. And so I kind of started there and kind of just went down the line, whether it was, you know, um, a different kind of acting class, um, an acting method, uh, improv, singing, all the stuff we've mentioned. And I just kind of went down the line, and whatever I felt was beneficial to me, I was like, I'm, I'm going to do that. You know, this kind of goes back to the whole risk, risk taking thing, mm -hmm. and, and taking those chances. Like, if it, even if it scared me, I was like, I'm gonna do this. So whatever, whatever I needed to do to better myself. Awesome. Um, Can I add to that? Yeah. Um, we mentioned how much and and how how wide the genre of voiceover is. When you're starting and you're creating your first roadmap don't stare at the whole meal take it a bite at a time so focus on the thing you know focus on a piece of it do you want to start with commercial great focus there get yourself in a place where you feel good do those classes once you're comfortable there then branch out move on it will all always be there for you but if you try and do everything at once you will you will just get overwhelmed so that's true really, that's very like, true take it a bite at a time figure out the, the one thing you want to start with and then you can expand. That's great. That's great advice. Um, someone asked, uh, "What if you're broke, but you have, but you want to be a voice actor? <laughs> what do you do?" There are, <laughs> there are um, classes you can. So, some of the theater classes I took out here, like Theater West, had a program for um, young actors. They could volunteer and um, help clean the theater and then pay like $10 a month and have class every Saturday for several hours. So there are ways to take acting classes that aren't, that won't, you know, like break the bank. And also some uh, acting studios too, you can um, clean at the studios or, you know, volunteer in the office and get a discount on those classes. Mm. Awesome. And then the gear too, it doesn't have to be super expensive. I know people who use their phone um, to record audio and stuff. So if you have like a smartphone, I, I um, you can find like relatively cheap-ish stuff. But I think Kimberly and Garen, you all mentioned like the most important thing is to have like a quiet space. So yeah. lock yourself in a closet. <laughs> um, Spend time practicing. Yeah. Like you might not be able to afford the class right now. You may be saving up for the class. But spend your time practicing. There are online auditions. You may not send it in, but you can at least take that audition, go on your own, practice that, see how you feel about those characters. Um, the work that you do on your own time for yourself is just as important as the money you spent on the class. True. Absolutely. Um, I'm not sure what this question is, but... I'm gonna have, let's see, what's part of, what's part of the best for voiceover? What's the best part about voice, voicing over in a booth, especially at home, I think is what this means? <laughs> uh, getting to be wild and crazy and make silly faces and just do your own thing, and that's... <laughs> and no one's beautiful. looking. <laughs> no one's looking. <laughs> you can be as weird as you want, because no one's looking at you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> awesome. All right, well... We are pretty much at time. 
thank you, Garrett, Heather, and Kimberly. I hope everybody found this panel super useful for whether you are wanting to get into it or not, or just curious. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, and then stick around for the next panel. Bye. Yay. Hi, thank thanks you. everybody. Thank nice you. Nice meeting y'all. <laughs>